602. First order of business is Finance Committee and Squad. Eric? That's Todd. Todd Ersig. Excuse me? It's Ersig. Ersig. Okay, thank you. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in physics? Uh, yeah, I just moved to uh, Woodstock a couple years ago. I live over on uh, across from Gilbert's Hill, and uh, just been trying to get become a part of the community a little bit. But um, I don't know if you have my. Uh, I I did give my resume and my CV to you guys, and what it is is that I, I'm a finance is my uh, trade, and that's what I do for work. Currently, I work for Massachusetts. Mass Brigham, uh, and so it's Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham Women's Hospital and uh, 20 other hospitals throughout New England here and doing the finances for them uh, so that when there was an opportunity for a person on the finance committee, I was looking at it and saying, you know, uh, I'm pretty good with budgets and finance uh, that I'd be more than happy to help out uh, and learn the process. Uh, that you guys go through uh, as compared to what I do is that uh, right now, currently the financials closed for the hospitals and I have to get a, about 125 grants that I work on is what I usually work on in grants. And I do some clinical stuff also uh, and reconciling all of those done by the end of the week uh, and then start planning for, you know, what's going on in budgeting and everything else like that. Uh, submitting the grant applications, things of that is what I do on a daily basis. Uh, and so I uh, understand the pretty much the life cycle of a budget and a grant uh, and how to sit there and prepare a budget, set it up. Uh, and then after in a grants world, it's awarded in, you know, the town world. Uh, I would assume it's budgeted and there's finances. Um, I'm pretty good at managing how that money is spent and verifying and, you know, making sure that uh, all the expenses are appropriate and allowable um, and accountable. And it's sort of like what I do for a living. And I'm certified as a, a grants administrator and grants manager. And I've been doing it for about uh, 30 years now. Um, have you been to any of the finance committee meetings? I've been to three. Okay. Uh, will you be able to make the meetings? I will be able to make the meetings. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? No. No. So there's one spot available for the finance committee. Gotcha. I would move to appoint him to the committee. Do a second. I'll second. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. The Finance Committee. Thank you. Thank you. No, Thank no you. problem. Hopefully I can help out. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Next up is Stephanie Winant. Hello. Hi. Is it okay if I stay in here? No, you can. Is there a mic up there? Yeah, we, we have a mic up there. There's not a camera. So. Okay. Um, so my name is Stephanie Wyant. I moved to Woodstock in 2018. I've never done any um, sort of town volunteering or been on any committees or so I'm a first timer for sure. Um, I applied to three different positions. Um, grand juror sounded the most interesting to me, uh, town agent and then auditor. Um, honestly, I don't know what any of those positions do. Um, I've done auditing in my job. I am a employee relations specialist. Um, so I do a lot of disciplinary actions, um, adverse actions, things like that, where I work with lawyers a lot. So that's why the grand juror was interesting to me. Um, but I didn't really, I was trying to look up about the grand juror, like what they do. Um, it seems like an antiquated position and that they don't really have much authority. Um, so I'd just be interested to know what they do and um, still interested in, in that position, depending on you know what it entails. Um, other than that, I really, I just saw that there were a lot of vacancies and 
figured I'd throw my name in the hat and kind of see where I could fit. Um, so if I could check for a second. So first of all, thank you for volunteering. Uh, we want more people coming in and volunteering. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Uh, I do have an update for the board. Uh, based on tonight's meeting, I reached out uh, to the state and the grand juror position was um, done away with in 2017 by uh, an act by the state legislature. So there is no grand juror position uh, and the town does not have a charter that lists one. Um, so that is a position that currently does not exist. Um, and there is no kind of work to be done for them. Uh, in the past, for reference, um, they had the authority to enforce criminal misdemeanor laws, ordinance violations, um, and other things such as that. Uh, now all that goes to the state's attorney, obviously. Um, so that position kind of no longer exists. So I'd recommend the board not appoint anyone to the position uh, as, as we should not have one. Uh, okay. And we remind ourselves to get, get rid of this at town meeting next year. Um, so that's just an update on that. Uh, when it comes to the other, two other positions that are open, um, the town agent is kind of somewhat similar. Um, it has no real authority. Uh, it's basic uh, premise is if the town is involved in a lawsuit, they can ask the town agent to assist. Uh, but beyond that interaction, there's there's no real uh, work that gets done. Um, finally, uh, the auditor position uh, was something we were supposed to eliminate this past town meeting, uh, and we did not. Um, the village got rid of it last year. Um, and again, I, I think if you want a position that maybe something you could work in, uh, in theory, what the auditor does is take the auditor report that we pay uh, an auditor firm to do for us and then reads it aloud publicly at the meeting um, as the equipment of the position. Um, but it, it might give you a sense to, you know, go through our audit and look at things and, you know, um, you know, contribute the way you want to in, in that sense. Um, so those are the kind of the two appointment positions we have. Um, we do have an opening on the conservation committee, um, and I believe there's also one opening on the EDC uh, as other opportunities if you want to pursue that as well. Um, but I don't want to discourage you at all, so I'm trying to give you everything you can to, to make a decision if you want. Um, so that's what we have. Um, I haven't been to any of the committee meetings, so I guess I would want to go to those first before I join one of the committees. Um, but the auditor, if you need someone in that position, I would certainly do that. Um, Otherwise, it seems like the other two positions you're not really looking for anymore. Um, so up to you. I would love for your enthusiasm to go to I think that's really useful. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the EDC is uh, a group that gets uh, a large amount of money each year, um, but then kind of redirects that, that money into the community. Um, and they're going to get a new direction in about a month from this board. Um, so that might be an exciting opportunity to kind of actually make change in the community um, and work with a large range of people from housing to infrastructure to town development. How big is that committee? Uh, it's 10 members. Nine. 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 Well, nine. ideally, there should be nine. There are eight right now, okay. and they're seeking a ninth, and they meet on the first Thursday of the month. And the, uh, the Conservation Commission meets on the third Wednesday, and they are a board of Five. seven. Yeah, they're down to five right now, right? They're down to five right now. So technically we need two. Okay. So I wouldn't yeah, I would encourage you to attend those meetings if you think they're a fit. Okay. Is that is that kind of what yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, is that okay, Stephanie? Yeah. I we really love enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. We want you to stay enthusiastic. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. So I think there is a requirement to go to the committee meetings before you can be on the committees. Um, but I will definitely look into the EDC. That sounds interesting. And if you want, we can hook you up with the chair of the EDC and you can even meet with him individually to kind of get a better sense of what they okay. do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Planning Commission. So just we wanted to, is William here? No. Okay. We did, I'm going to say he's not online. We did email him to let him know that the same issue. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Um, so with the Planning Commission, um, there are two open spots. There are three candidates. Um, all three candidates interviewed last week with the trustees. Um, and the uh, assumption or advice from me is that tomorrow in the joint meeting, there's an executive session for both boards to get together and talk about which two candidates uh, they agree to. Okay. Yep, that works. Okay. First one is Alex Mully. 
Alex Mully, um, South Woodstock resident since October 2022. Um, I've gotten to know some of you in the context of the working group formed to evaluate possible municipal ownership of the Aqueduct Company. It's a pretty topical subject <laughs> right now. Um, I, I got involved in that because of my professional background and um, new to the community, um, you know, just wanting to get involved and wanting to understand how things work in the town I've moved to. Um, it's been a good experience. Um, I think that planning commission is a logical continuation of staying involved. Um, I'd like to do that. Um, I've spoken to Stephen and Laura about what it entails. Uh, so I think I have an understanding about, um, about what the, you know, the commission is, you know, given a charge from select board. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I'd be enthusiastic about participating in. I, I have the time to do it. Um, I do not have formal like zoning or planning background, um, but quick study and uh, definitely dig into whatever I commit my time to. Um, have you been to any of the meetings? I intended to attend the last one as the night of big snowstorm. So um, I did not make it to that. And Nobody did. Okay, um, and you have the time. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next up is Alicia Tallo. Hey. Hi. Do you want me to just give you a summary? Or... Okay. So I'm Alicia Tarlo. Um, I, I moved here full time in just before school started in August, but I've been in and out of Woodstock for about 12 years. I lived in Heartland for two or three years, about 12 years ago, and I have a place in Palm Fret and have been here part time in between. So I, I love Woodstock. I'm one of those people that came to visit 12 years ago and a month later moved to Heartland. I just absolutely love it to death. I have um, my background is mostly in real estate. All of my working career has been in real estate, everything from just selling houses to, um, I had a real estate fund in Germany where we had mixed use buildings, all very old buildings. I've renovated historic buildings, um, historic houses. So uh, I have a lot of familiarity with that portion of planning. Um, I feel like planning, the zoning and planning is kind of the core of everything in a community. So it tells you, you know, it, it shaped our community to be the way it is, and it shapes how it will be in the future. So I think it's just, the, in some facets, the most important part of, of what we can do here. And so that's why I just always thought that's where I want to be a part of, or at least to start get involved, getting involved in town, in the town work. So, yeah, I know Frank, I know Ben. Um, I've talked to Frank here and there uh, when, about some of his planning work. So I have a sense of what's going on there and I have no time just like everybody else, but I can make every meeting and do all the work needed. <laughs> um, have you been to any meetings at all? I've been to about one and a half meetings. Okay. Okay. <laughs> any questions? Um, I was just wondering if you've had a chance to look at the town plan. I read the town plan. I did. Um, and it's a really good town plan. I'm, I'm a little confused by it about like the timing of it because it says it was just redone, but some of the parts didn't seem new. So I'm curious to learn more about the plan and what was, I guess, renovated in the plan when and what is actually, what has happened and what hasn't in all of the action statements and so forth. But I, I think it's, it's a really good town plan compared to other plans I've seen. It's just really thorough and very clear so, yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you. It doesn't look like Stephen. Uh, he might not be here if the time is listed. Yeah. Give him a time. So if he comes in later, we can always. Yeah. Hey, yeah. okay, addition, additions and deletions. Uh, so two, we're gonna add an executive session uh, at the end. Uh, then also we want to add a town hall update from the working group um, that was created. Okay. Okay. Citizens' comments.
Uh, I just wanted to um, comment on the planning commission. Um, I urge you to, so you're, there's two candidates, you're, you're doing two candidates, is that correct? It's two spots, yes. Two spots, so I urge you to select those candidates who you feel are gonna be most open-minded and planful about making the necessary changes to take Woodstock forward into the future and not mired in the past. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? You're up. Um, so just a few things. One, um, after way too long of debates, um, July 5th is going to be the date for the July 4th fireworks. Um, it's a Friday. We're unable to get the actual July 4th as a date. Uh, but we figured the next day, Friday, going to a Saturday would be a good alternative. Um, same band, hopefully the same as everything else, just a, a different day. So we're excited about that. Um, we have received the final audit from our auditors. Uh, so that'll be sent to the boards uh, in the coming days. And then we'll schedule a joint meeting with the auditor to come in and discuss their findings and the financials for Woodstock for FY23. Um, there will be a joint meeting tomorrow at 5 p.m. Uh, between the select board and the village trustee members um, to kind of get together for the first time and discuss the short-term rental ordinance uh, and kind of then make a timeline for what happens next. So I just want to remind everyone of that. Uh, of course, it'll be a public meeting. Uh, and then finally, I just want to touch base. Um, about two weeks ago now, I held um, a summit with about uh, 20 different town managers from the Upper Valley. Uh, it was very successful. I want to thank uh, the Woodstock Resort, uh, Mascoma, uh, VC3, and EgoPixel and EDC for uh, sponsorship. Um, we got great feedback. Um, I was told by many people it was the best event they went to as a town manager. Um, one person said they learned more in the two days and they learned two years on the job. Um, so I'm very happy with the outcome and we're kind of looking at next steps. Uh, one of them, based on feedback, is trying to do something similar for select board members uh, and kind of getting them in the room and talking about their issues and their challenges and seeing if we can have some success with that. So I'll keep you updated on that. Um, and that's all I have. Question? Okay. Short term rental update. So I've been from the Planning Commission. Um, if it's okay with the board, um, I think last week Ben presented to the village of Shees uh, with all the questions and he actually went through and read every single word for every answer they had. Um, I think that was done partly because uh, the questions were sent to the board members, you know, about 24 hours before the meeting, so they didn't have time to really read them and get through them. Um, my hope is that the board members now, the public has had time to um, go through and read the questions and the answers. Um, and so I'd recommend if, unless there's a need for it, if we kind of skip over the reading of the questions and go right into the select board's questions um, on the answers and kind of go from there. Yeah, works. And for members of the public, if you don't know, there's uh, hard copies of the questions is up front. I'll pass them out if anyone wants them. Yeah, I'll start, I guess, Ben. Yeah. Um, one of the questions uh, I would say that's surfaced in the past few weeks that maybe Carrie asked at the initial meeting, um, but I think is worth revisiting is, um, I'm curious as to why the Planning Commission didn't set in zone caps um as a part of the ordinance yeah it's a good question so um we definitely came across other municipalities that have a by zone cap um they were typically um municipalities that had very simple zoning districts um and very few zoning districts so um it was easy to kind of manage um uh caps because it they only had, you know, maybe five zoning districts in their entire town. Um, Woodstock has over 25 zoning districts between the town and the village. And um, the complexity needed to uh, manage a cap on each district um, was more than more, or, or it was more difficult to manage um, those caps with very little to gain. So I, I think the underlying question or underlying comments about having caps on districts is not to have an adverse 
um, effect of short-term rentals too concentrated in any one district. Um, but since we have um, kind of stated that uh, keeping the uh, existing permitted holders of short-term rentals to be able to continue um, was one of our first and foremost um, um, objectives that um, generating cap based on district uh, necessarily wouldn't be able to accommodate those people who are already permitted. Um, and I think uh, at the trust, um, one of the last meetings, somebody came forward who uh, had a public comment about um, the adverse effect that short-term rentals had on their experience because three of their neighbors were um, short-term rental owners. Um, a cap on any specific district doesn't restrict the location of where short-term rentals occur. So um, even if there was a cap on that specific district, it wouldn't have really solved the issue that person had with um, short-term rent, um, with short-term rentals. So um, the ease, uh, the simplicity of just having an overall cap, um, we felt was a much more manageable and realistic objective for Woodstock with how complex our zoning is. Great, thank you. Um, how, how many um, short-term rentals do we have now? Um, we have uh, about 70 permitted short-term rentals, and then um, have estimated that there are probably about 14 um, additional short-term rentals that are existing in the rural and a rural uh, five-acre and forestry districts that um, are existing under a pre-existing non-conforming use. So they uh, were occurring before zoning regulations put in. So they're you know legally existing as uh, current use holders. Um, so 84 is the number that we are saying are permitted. Um, but we have found that they're probably in existing at any time um, between 180 and 200 short-term rentals in Woodstock. Any other questions? I just think it's worth um, adding once again to the record because I have gotten a lot of feedback and I don't see it specifically called out here. Um, but a lot of people feel that owner occupied STRs, say an ADU, versus non homestead ADRs that are a second property that's income producing for someone who may or may not use the property regularly should be handled differently. Um, and it seems that the registrations being the same seems a little bit punitive to owner occupied STRs and inconsequential to places that are just investments. And so can you talk a little bit about what your counsel was yep. and, and why you've come down this way? So most of the decisions was definitely balancing um, an aversion to risk with um, an ordinance. Um, there definitely is a um, uh, likelihood with um, ordinances on short-term rentals that there are litigation risks um, with any uh, proposals going forward. Um, we found that having an equal split between um, non-owner occupied and owner occupied um, lowered the town's risk of litigation significantly. And it was worth for us to set a bar that allowed all pre-existing um, permitted uh, holders um, to continue operation. And so while the split is even at 55 to 55, um, because uh, of that uh, 70 permitted uh, current short-term rental owners, um, about two thirds of that is a non-owner occupied and one third owner occupied. So that 55 cap for non-owner occupied um, will be hit very quickly. And we see that happening in the first year that it would hit that 55 cap, uh, therefore essentially stopping future growth on non-owner occupied rentals where for owner occupied, less than half of those, um, that 55 cap, uh, I think, so a third of, of 70 uh, are permitted now. Um, when we looked at the other short-term rentals operating uh, without a permit, there's still a very low number of owner occupied that we estimated that probably no more than 30 of those 55 registrations would be filled in that first year. So, uh, 
we didn't feel that 55 cap restricted growth by any means of non-owner occupied. I think there was a general consensus that um, there's a lot of good arguments for allowing owner occupied short-term rentals to continue um, and didn't see a need to limit that. So having that 55 cap while it looks like it's even and it is even um, allows for a significant amount of growth. Um, and I also point out as I pointed in there, you know, this ordinance is definitely a point of time. So, you know, it can be affected later on. So if we reach that cap of 55 and the town decides that we want to grow, you know, that can be adjusted later on. And the registration fees are the same for owner occupied versus they are not. No. What are they? Okay. So uh, we proposed a um, uh, $750 fee for uh, owner occupied and a 3000 for non owner occupied and then a $250 per occupant um, of that. So that was a proposal. Um, again, that's okay. up to debate for you guys. Yeah. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? I kind of just one question. Um, ben, how many meetings do you estimate the Planning Commission have had on this uh, publicly? Um, publicly, um, we've had since, um, at least six months um, of public uh, meetings. So at least once a month and then last couple of months, twice a month. So um, probably about eight public meetings. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so uh, can I enjoy uh, C Focuson, uh, we see you. Uh, we'll get to you right after this conversation. Okay. Roger. Nope. There's only one place to, to stand around here. Um, I just want to echo Carrie's question um, and and the concern. So from my perspective, people I've heard talking, the biggest concern is the impact on the owner occupied. And I understand that it's capped currently, and and I think it's a very good approach to have a lower fee for that. But in terms of the actual impact on housing stock in the village, the, the non-owner occupied are clearly having a much larger impact. And I understand that we have to pay attention to the fact that the real estate, the, the short-term rental lobby has implicitly threatened to sue the town. Um, I was in a meeting about a year ago where there was an implicit threat to sue the town if there was any difference in the restriction on non-owner occupied versus owner occupied. And, and clearly people who have been working on this have a much better handle on it. And I don't wanna call that understanding and that into question, but I would, going forward, I, I would urge that we go ahead and pass this, but going forward, I would say, let's look for ways that we can start dialing down on the non-owner occupied, which are, again, are clearly having the major impact on housing here and the cost of housing here. So, so again, I urge you to pass this, but, but I think we should be looking for, for ways that we can go forward on dealing with, with what, are the, what are causing the, the most likely negative effects on, on housing and and lifestyle in the town and maybe at some point being willing to take on a little bit more risk in terms of that and i don't know what other precedents legally have done um so that would clearly involve asking lawyers if you know if northampton massachusetts did this did they lose the case or whatever so so again i i, I urge you to go ahead and adopt this but but i would really like to look for ways to address the most important part of the problem a little more aggressively to the extent that does not bring the town in, into great risk. Thanks. Can you? Yeah. My apologies. Up in, yeah. And uh, could you just yeah. say your name for? Sure. Um, Paula Townsend, um, resident. So correct me if I know. You need to address the chair. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So what I was hearing from Ben was that there is estimated to likely be between 180 and 200 overall um, short-term rentals at any given time, which I don't know if he meant that includes the 75-ish 
permitted ones or not, um, regardless of that, of the number over the 75 permitted, I would be curious how many they estimate of those are owner occupied versus non owner occupied. And if we don't have any iota of a clue, then that is one more push, I think, towards not finalizing a plan with a cap until we know the real numbers. Yeah, so that um, 180-200 does include the permitted um, short-term rentals. And um, uh, Stephen probably can answer the question about how many are owner-occupied or non-occupied. But in um, our um, uh, discussions, uh, he said a very low number are owner-occupied and felt comfortable that um, the amount that were non or the amount that were owner occupied, uh, we still wouldn't even come close to the cap of 55. So I don't have the exact breakdown, um, but the understanding was that the vast majority are non owner occupied short term rentals. So do you, do you estimate there's about 150 out there now? Uh, is that anywhere from 180 to 200? 180 to 200. And yeah. 70 of them are permitted that we know of that do the thing correctly, the other ones are. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Yep. Does that answer your question? but we can't hear that person on Zoom. They're not yeah, speaking thanks, to the microphone. Yep, thank you. I, I want to be careful that we're, if we're going to discuss this tomorrow, like how much we want to discuss, but I think I'll just say, having done some of this work, that there's no way for us to know definitively if they're owner-occupied or non-owner-occupied because it takes a great amount of work if they're not permitted to trace down the address, which doesn't exist in a lot of the advertisements. And I think we're also making an assumption that we haven't already tried to bring those people into compliance, which is patently false. So I, I think that any number we're going to get from the Planning Commission is, in my understanding, the best guesstimate we could have. I think we can, you know, in the next step of the legislative process, make any adjustments the board seeks to want to make, which is the point. Um, and, and thank, you know, the Planning Commission for their advice and recommendation, but it's not certainly a binary that we have to either pass or reject. So the two things that I, I think is one, what is our confidence that we are able to bring these non-compliant STRs into compliance with our new ordinances? And two, you know, I think it's important to look at what um, STR percentages are in other communities. Mm -hmm and make sure we're still aligned with things that are working out well in other communities. I mean, we're not in inventing a wheel, so. Yeah, and maybe Ben, you wanna to speak to the percentages, the housing uh, percentages. Yeah, what was the first question or first issue you said yet to? Talk about how confident we are that we're able to bring non-conforming oh, yeah, okay. into compliance. Yeah, um, that, that's easier to answer because um, you know, right now you'd argue that we can't do that because we don't have any enforcement mechanisms and that's why they're exist so many non-permitted SDRs. Um, and even the permitted SDRs, there's you know certain things in place that we just can't keep up with the, uh, the management of it. So um, in the proposed um, budget, there is additional money, or there's already uh, budgeted money in there for the software program. So the software program is the essential key to allow 
any enforcement because it you know it scrapes the data and shows exactly what is out there. And so um, without that data and that record, it's kind of impossible to follow up on. So that's the first step. And the other step is um, additional funding for uh, personnel to actually manage the program. So, um, you know, uh, Stephen's probably the best to respond to how his department feels about responding to it. But, you know, in conversations with him, um, they feel with those two things, they'd oh, be able to do known it. known for years that our yeah. regs are toothless. So, yeah. Um, as far as percentages, um, uh, you know, as a comparison that I put in there, you know, Burlington's at about 2% of housing units um, are short term rentals. They did enact um, much stricter short term rental reg uh, ordinance because they do not allow um, uh, non hosted um, short term rentals. So essentially, non or occupied um, rentals aren't allowed. Um, uh, so they have about 2%, and I forget that's you know 200 some units. Um, obviously, a much bigger municipality than we are. Um, Stowe, on the other hand, has over a thousand um, short term rentals, and that's you know almost somewhere around a quarter of their um, uh, um, housing units as short term rentals. So, uh, just as Vermont examples, you know, that's kind of the range, and it, and it can vary quite a bit. Um, we recommended that five to six percent because it, it felt an appropriate number um, to have, you know, one in 20 houses be a short term rental. And once you start going up in that number, um, you know, that balance of character of neighborhood and um, quality of life for residents, um, while we definitely argue that um, owner occupied um, allows people to keep living in Woodstock and stay in Woodstock and afford their housing. There still are some negative effects to short term rentals. So there is a need to kind of make sure there's not un, you know, unlimited um, short term rentals everywhere. But our five to 6% was kind of the board's collective comfort range of what the amount of housing could be um, for short term rentals where it didn't start to feel like it was out of balance. Um, and definitely felt that the importance of having those caps um, at that. 110, which gets us in that five to six percent, um, does the one thing of stopping not the continued expansion of non occupied, which um, many would argue are, is the most detrimental for many reasons, um, but still allows for a significant growth of the owner occupied. So, do we know if Burlington's been sued for having a no non hosted policy? Um, I believe they are currently under litigation. Yeah. I don't know the specifics of it, but they are. No, any outcomes? Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on up. When we say unit, I'm hearing unit, maybe I'm translating as unit, but when we're looking at that five to six percent, if somebody owns a building with, say, two or three units that are being short term rental does each one of those units <laughs> equal one of that 55 or building with several short term rental units in it one of the 55 yeah so we're looking at housing units so um you know if it's apartments it's apartments it's not just a specific building thank you um, I think Wendy has a question or comment online. Wendy. Thank you, Eric. Um, I have a question for the Planning Commission. Uh, Wendy Mirinen, village resident. Um, I have a question for the Planning Commission. If if the discussion, what went into the discussion regarding um, limits on frequency that as such that we current have versus switching to unlimited rentals and, and the reason i ask this question is what i feel is a an invitation for commercial enterprise in a residential neighborhood so i would love to hear what the if you could lead us through the dialogue or the the decision making process in a short way <laughs> in a quick way 
um, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of things. One, um, right now there are caps, um, but again, there's no um, enforcement of caps and that we found pretty systematic um, use of short-term rentals in an unlimited capacity already. Um, uh, so without enforcement, that's essentially kind of what happens in many cases. Um, the um, ability to for short-term rentals um, to generate revenue and pay for uh, the fees is also considered because uh, to actually enforce and regulate any short-term rental ordinance uh, effectively requires a lot of um, administrative costs. And uh, the ability to pay for that cost um, is offset because you're now allowed to rent unlimited um, amount of times. Um, some zoning districts already have unlimited in, in forestry and in, in R5, you're already allowed unlimited rentals. So there's no change there. Um, and then it graduates down and the most strict is in the villages six times per year and unlimited during foliage. But again, without, um, without any oversight, uh, we found that in many cases, um, those regulations aren't followed. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello, this is Derek DeMoss. I'm a long-term, short-term rental owner, uh, Woodstock resident. Had a few questions, one being of that uh, 180 to 200 listings that were found on platforms, uh, was there any uh, distinction in dis deciding or determining what were duplicate listings, what were on cross platforms, what were listings that said they were Woodstock but might be outside of town boundaries, like in Palm Frid Bridgewater, um, uh, surrounding towns? Um, another thing, I, I've been dealing with a lot of the short term rental owners. I've reached out to many of them and working with them. Some of them are uh, non permitted. Um, uh, a lot of them don't know where to find the information to be in compliance. I've had somebody get in touch with me today. They can't find the application for the town short-term rental permit because it's at the bottom of the village short-term rental permit link on the zoning website. Um, so I think there's a lot of people out there who are not compliant because it's just been a difficult procedure and task to um, figure out what's needed, what's not needed. There's a village ordinance currently, but also in village zoning, there's also STR rules that don't reflect what the village um, ordinance does. So it is extremely confusing for some people, and it's something that uh, uh, labeling a non-conforming STR as somebody who's um, uh, just going out of the way, their way not to be conforming is um, not necessarily what their intentions are. Um, one question I did have is what's the benefit of eliminating the existing non-conforming use in the R5 forestry districts for um, the uh, short-term rental usage as it was uh, prior to 2019? And one confirmation for you guys, last village trustee select board meeting, there was a vote to continue the moratorium for short-term rentals through the end of December. There was no mention in that meeting on the vote or the warning that the bed and breakfast were included in that moratorium. Um, just wondering if that was included in that, if that was implied in that, or if that was something that was just off the table and not being considered. Thank you. Uh, I mean, to respond to the first comment, um, I think if you look at the, the ordinance for short-term rentals, um, it explicitly says that you cannot operate without um, a permit. Um, whether it's hard to find the application or not, I, I can't speak to, but um, it is out there that it's very ex uh, especially written that you do need a permit to have a short-term rental um, and then argue that it, all it is is a phone call away to the zoning office to clarify any uh, permit application needs. Um, and the second question, uh, why eliminate forestry and R5 um, non-conforming use um, and ordinance um, does not um, uh, look at uh, zoning regulations. So to, by doing ordinance, um, it kind of supersedes any 
uh, non-conforming use. So everybody becomes compliant. Um, but I would also say that it doesn't eliminate the ability for forestry and R5 to continue as they are operating. It just requires them to get um, a permit. And on the last point, I believe the vote was to extend the moratorium that was already in place, and that moratorium does include bed and breakfast, I believe. So it was implied that it would be both of them. Any other questions? I would ask we go back to the Planning Commission interviews for Stephen Helkerson, who's been patient online for us. Hi. Hi there, Eric. Um, also, just a quick question. I think on your agenda, uh, you actually had the other two, uh, Alex and Elisa, um, yes. before me. Um, it, maybe I missed that part or something, but. Um... We got through that, pa yeah. that part really fast, Steve. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> We're moving along. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm yeah. impressed. <laughs> okay. We're making record time tonight. I guess so. Okay. Um, do so you want to oh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the position? Sure. So, um, as I uh, mentioned in my last interview, and maybe uh, wasn't uh, explained enough, so I don't want to be too long winded, but um, I am a, a new resident. My wife and I are new to, to uh, Woodstock. We've just been here, uh, owners just over two years, and uh, lived here since uh, June of 2022. Uh, my background, and, and this is our one and only home, by the way, um, this is not a second home, uh, so we're all in in Woodstock, and uh, how we found our, our way here is, to me, uh, just um, not a surprise, because you, maybe all of us have arrived here if you weren't born here, I'm just so uh, impressed with the village, and um, I will say that uh, throughout my career, I've I've lived primarily in small towns. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, but that was not where my heart was, and I left there many decades ago, and um, have always found myself attracted to small town life, and uh, so happy and grateful to be part of the Woodstock community here now, and seeing how people operate and function, and the ability to talk with one another um, is quite impressive to me, uh, regardless of your political outlook or anything else. I just uh, have enjoyed the opportunity to interact with people here and be part of the community. And I know my wife is getting more and more heavily involved. Um, my background is in in uh, general contracting. Uh, my early years, um, 1980s through uh, 1990s. And then I uh, migrated into facilities management, first as a planner estimator and moved to Boston area and worked there for seven years and then uh, moved back to the Midwest and was a facilities director of a four-year liberal arts college uh, in southern Illinois, right on the Mississippi River. It was a historic national site, um, historic place, and um, enjoyed that living in, a, again, another very small community, but also at that time as being facilities director, um, became very much interested in master planning. And um, and help the college begin the the process of of master planning for the college for the next number of years out decades out. Um, so I found that to me to be a, of great interest. I love working with different people, um, work with different crews. So uh, backing up a little bit, I, I was facilities director there of about a million one hundred thousand square feet and had a staff of about 65 people, full-time employees, and we handled everything there um, on site. And I think about a little bit about Eric. Um, I was kind of the town manager um, uh, from the standpoint of just handling the, the, the budgets for all of the utilities, all of the services provided other than uh, computing and food service, but I handled everything else. And we are a self-contained uh, campus, um, had many, many projects, um, put in a new sewage treatment plant um, there while I was uh, as facilities director as part of this master plan. And I just have always been uh, uh, touched by the opportunity to work with great people who um, put their work above their 
um, the, the work that they do and, and services they provide above their, their self-interests. And um, so migrating here and coming to Woodstock was quite uh, quite a change for us from the standpoint that it was going back to uh, kind of my roots, um, if I can say that, and working with just some thoughtful, dedicated people. And I, uh, in the two years I've been here, I've recognized there's clearly a great need and I think particularly on the infrastructure side um, was a, was uh, tried to get involved and understand better the needs for the, the high school, middle school, and went through and met with, I think it was Joe, who's the facilities director there, and walked through that facility because I am fairly knowledgeable about uh, uh, school needs and campus needs. And um, it was really quite touched about how they had put together, a, to me, a, a very thoughtful plan. Uh, realize there's different perspectives on that, but they certainly uh, feel like they did their work. And I would agree with Joe that there was a great need there. Um, the campus that I was on was built in the 1930s in the Midwest, and we had um, many, many problems uh, there. And we also owned all of our own facilities, all of our infrastructure. So natural gas lines, water, sewer, all of it was ours to manage. And uh, there's some similarities here um, also. You have all underground electrical system here within the, the uh, village core. And uh, we had that on our campus. And I know it just takes a great deal of planning and, and um, thoughtful um, inclusion of the community to put together a master plan that serves the institution where you're at for decades. So anyway, that's a bit of a rambling on my part. I, I apologize. I don't know how much you folks realize I, I'm new here, but um, it just, we love the community. We love to serve. And I think this is kind of a critical time to um, put your oar in the water if you want to be of, of um, help and service to the community you live in. So I'll leave that <laughs> as opening comments. Thank you. Um, typical question it would ask, you'll be able to make all the meetings? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, they're, uh, what, first Wednesday, I believe, of, of the month, and uh, um, that's certainly my goal. I'm uh, typically there in town, and I see no reason why I shouldn't be able to, uh, to fulfill that duty. Any other questions? Thank you. We're meeting tomorrow night with the trustees to make our decisions. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with everybody and have a good meeting. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Next is the liquor license applications. Um, we can do them all at one time. I don't want to approve them well, all. Well, yeah. Can I make one comment? I'm um, sorry. Um, so, Sante just has a few outstanding uh, parking tickets. So um, I talked to the police chief today, and he's okay with us approving that on the assumption that they will pay the parking tickets when we get hold of them. So I think if you want to approve, go through and approve them all, uh, just with the. Um, I'd approve with Susan's general caveat. Yes. And also that Asante pays their outs. Yes. Okay. Do a second. All second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. The All right, Scott um, Helmus is going to be here, but I don't think he is. Um, so the first one is for um, 27 Pleasant Street. Um, they want to now construct a, a new restaurant um, on that property. Um, they're looking for increase in flow. Um, you have all the information there. Um, And they paid their fee. I believe they have, yes. Nikki, have they paid their fee yet? Or are they waiting for after approval? Uh no, they pay the uh fee prior to coming to the board. Okay. And did Adam Michelson pay his fee as well? Uh yes. Both Adam, have paid. I'd move to approve both of those. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Next, we have an abatement request. Abatement request, and Eric checked into this, and they did not use any water for the year. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the next one is just a annual local management management fee uh, plan. Sorry, uh, you have it in your booklet. Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, so I just need the, the chair to sign, and David Green will sign, and we'll send it over, and we'll be all set. Okay, do we need a motion? Yeah, motion to approve the plan. And approve. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, so next, oh, sorry, do you want to do the, uh, yeah, yeah town hall. I'll do the town hall. If I was going to share my screen, um, that's okay. You should be good to go. Thanks, Nikki. All right, so this is in everybody's packet, but this is just a breakdown of the work that the town hall working group, which is me, Ray, and Eric have been doing. Um, so just as a refresher, in December, we were tasked um, in addition with the scope, um, with defining what affordability meant in terms of the criteria, um, we decided that the best measure of that would be the current value of the building itself, which according to the Lister's office is about a million and a half. Um, we decided against a formal appraisal due to the cost and availability of appraisers, um, specifically uh, public and municipal building appraisers, um, but still feel this is an accurate data point for us to use. Um, Eric was also able to update the list of staff requirements, which built on the list that was created by the first committee. Um, Ray went through and made a list of potential relocation options, including space to rent, purchase, and or construct. We also met with uh, Alita Wilson, the executive director of Pentangle, who informed us of the existence of some bank accounts and some funding um, that is remaining from the first town hall renovation committee. Um, and also, as you may have noticed during this time, we have moved some town offices around um, to better serve their functions. Um, we've met a handful of times and we kept kind of coming up against um, what is going to happen and I would assume is the next few months, which is the priorities and goal setting that we're looking to do um, over the next few months. And so our recommendation was um, to postpone for a few months our work so that we could be aligned with the goals and the priorities we set um, over April and May with Eric's work. But I'm happy to take questions. Great. Okay. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is kind of um, setting a date for a public forum for the uh, what's like I company. Um, the board. Um, got the financial analysis from uh, the firm we hired, Gallery, to look at the aqueduct. Uh, we've also entered an agreement with an engineer, uh, and the hope is to kind of have a public forum like we did in August uh, with the financial firm uh, present and the engineers present for the public and the board to ask questions and get answers, um, try to be as transparent as possible to get all the information we know about the aqueduct out there publicly uh, before the board and then the public uh, votes on an acquisition. Um, so I'm hoping to set a date in the coming weeks um, to get that all situated. Um, so if the board's okay with that, I can start scheduling with their consultants uh, and come back with a few dates for the boards. Yep. That will. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you mind coming in? Um, we just got a notification from the Aqueduct Company that they're going to double the rate. Um, which, uh, you know, it's not a surprise, and they obviously have a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, the, the discussions that I've been at about this are talking about the town starting to do a whole bunch of work if we actually acquire the aqueduct company. Um, I don't expect anybody to have an answer for this now, but I think it would be worthwhile being prepared to address if we're currently going to double the rates, how is that going to affect, if it does affect the anticipated costs, operational costs for the town as opposed to the actual acquisition costs, um, once, once the town uh, takes control of the aqueduct company, if it does in fact take control. And 
Um, secondly, would this doubling of the rates of the current aqueduct company affect in any way the purchase price of the aqueduct company? Um, and again, I know that none of this stuff has been determined in any in any solid way, but I think it's going to come up. And you know, I don't care if my rates double now to do necessary work, but if they're going to double again when the town buys it, that's going to start being of concern, not just to me, but to a whole bunch of people. So I think you're you probably should be prepared to address those questions to the extent that it's possible to do so. Yeah, I'll try to answer those as best I can. Uh, one, um, we won't talk about any ongoing negotiations publicly, obviously. Yeah, of course not. Um, yeah. uh, I'll leave that to the side. Um, the second, uh, the select board is aware of the rate increases. Um, I will say there's two separate things here. One is the aqueduct as a private company operating the way they see fit. Um, the second is if the town was to acquire it and how the town right. that runs the, uh, the water company could be completely different. So um, if the aqueduct were double the, doubles the fees and then the town then acquires the aqueduct, it does not mean that it will keep the same uh, fee structure. It could be increased dramatically. Um, we could have different priorities. Um, I think in the fee structure the aqueduct has, they have $120,000 for a new employee um, they have $150,000 for um, new pipes, um, other things that the town may decide to spend on something else. Um, so it's not going to be, we're not going to acquire it with the current rates they have and then not make any adjustments. And right. uh, based on the work we've done, we're uh, extremely confident that the town owned it, the rates would be lower and the, because the borrowing rate would be much lower. Okay, um, I mean, uh, that all makes perfect sense. And again, I don't expect anybody to have any definitive answer either today or when you have this public meeting. I think it's just something that's gonna need to be addressed. Some of the work that was anticipated by the engineers as they were coming up with some, some pricing perhaps, um, how much of that work might, have, might be taken care of by the current, current aqueduct companies and so again, I don't, I don't expect anybody to be able to answer this really ever definitively. Um, and I, I welcome the, the notion that the town can ultimately run this, probably more efficiently and certainly with less borrowing costs going forward. So, so I, I would just be prepared to address it in a public meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, other business. We're going to executive questions. Yep. Uh, I make uh, like a motion to go into executive session one VSA three thirteen to discuss negotiation of real estate or lease purchase. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. I just want to. Oh, uh, we got to go in the main room too. Okay. I have a better Thanks. setup. Have a good meeting. Thank Thanks, Roger. Thanks. Or a good executive session or whatever. <laughs> Before everybody leaves tonight, there's a first time on the upstream of the comment. So they missed my opportunity to talk to the if we're even taking them, but somebody advised me to just kind of get my consent first or kind of them on paper. I do want to A lot of it is probably super redundant to other people's thoughts. But I'll feel better knowing that I got out there and um, my name is on the list. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Our business was okay. Uh, The business, we'll start with that in a little minutes. I want to make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move to approve all the minutes. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Last but not least, motion to adjourn. So moved. So second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs>